This week I had the pleasure of interviewing Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk fame. He has a new book out, Playmakers, which we discuss. It was also interesting to talk about the way the NFL operates, the draft, and towards the end, briefly, about the Seahawks too. So you've tackled some big topics in the book. Significant history is discussed within the league. And there are stories in there, such as the origins of YouTube, that I'd never heard before. I had no idea how YouTube had come to be. Um, I learned words that I'd never heard before, such as Wizinator. What... <laughs> What prompted you to write a book like this? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. There will be plenty of folks in the UK who are envious of the fact that you've gotten the book because the release date there, I'm told, has been pushed back to May 4, and they have loudly complained to me. We have a significant and vocal and passionate group of folks who watch PFT Live on Sky Sports NFL or Sky Sports Action in the offseason who are patiently or otherwise awaiting the arrival of the book. And they make sure they regularly update me on the fact that they haven't gotten it yet. But I'll tell you the simplest version of the origin story of the book. It's not very interesting, but it's very accurate. Over the years, I've had people say to me, you seem to know a lot about the NFL. You should write a book about it, which at some level reflects a failure to fully appreciate what I do every single day. I write my book about the NFL from the moment I get up until the moment I go to bed with various pauses for food or doing the videos that we do throughout the course of the day. So I had no desire to find time beyond the time I already devote to writing about the NFL to write a book about the NFL. One of the reasons I love my platform is it's alive, it's organic. I can write new stories whenever I want. I don't have to get a publisher. I am the publisher. I can edit it whenever I want. I can change it whenever I want. I can update it. I can follow up whenever I want. It's immediate. I don't have to wait eight months for the book to come out. Well, things are changing and I'm going crazy because I want to add more chapters of the book. So, so long story bearable. After hearing for a period of years, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book. I finally decided I'm just going to write the damn book. So people will quit telling me you should write a book. So now when they tell me, because there will be many who like to say it to me, who don't realize I've written a book, I'll say, here's the book, leave me alone. I did it, I can check that off my list that I didn't even realize it was on my list. That's why I did it. That's, the, that's how I stumbled into it. Now I'm glad I did it, but that's how I stumbled into it. Now, if there are any people listening in the United Kingdom who would like to get the book before May, you can do that, which is what I did, by using the Kindle app. You will not get an actual copy of the book, which you know you want to have, and you've got it displayed in the background there, Mike. But um, if you want to read it, and this is kind of, there's a lull period now. We've kind of had free agency. We've got a bit between the drafts. So if you want something to fill a couple of weeks here, if you need a book to fill, then you can do it through the Kindle app, even if you are in the United Kingdom. Before I want to ask specifically about things in the book, Mike, I want to ask, do you ever sleep? Because oh, as yeah. an avid watcher of um, your videos, which appear, yes, they're on Skype. They're also on YouTube every day you seem to be writing constantly through the day so that when I go to bed, you often the last thing I look at is a tweet from Pro Football Talk where you've written something and then I wake up to the fact that you've written something on uh, and it's been posted on Twitter. Do you actually rest? I remember when I was much younger, back in the late 80s, I would hear stories about individuals who were able to function at a high level and only needed four hours of sleep Per night. Now, since then, I've learned that people lie about things like that, and they really are sleeping more than four hours a night. But secondly, as I've gotten older, I've learned how to sleep less than I used to, and maybe I don't need to, or maybe I am racking up a tremendous sleep debt that's going to cause me to drop dead prematurely. But I've gotten to the point where I will do five hours at night, and I'll sneak in one hour in the afternoon. So six a day. And sometimes on the weekend, I'll have the opportunity to do either the no alarm overnight rest or the no alarm nap. The no alarm nap is great because you never know how long you're going to sleep. There's nothing that wakes you up unless the dog starts barking. And there's always a chance you're going to pull a Rip Van Winkle and sleep for 20 years. There's nothing to wake you up. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll, treat myself with sleeping with nothing to wake me up. But 
usually, usually what happens is I'll still wake up at the same time tomorrow morning, Saturday morning. Don't have to be up for anything. I'll wake up the time that I do every other morning. The introduction in the book painted quite an uncomfortable picture of the NFL. In truth, it, you know, it, it kind of makes you feel a little bit guilty for enjoying the, the sport as, as much as you do, but it's also quite vivid and accurate um, in terms of describing what it's like for the players in this league. If more and more people come to embrace this view that you have written here, how different could this sport and this business be in the future, do you think? Well, very different. And the goal wasn't to make people feel guilty about enjoying the NFL, but if feeling guilty makes people realize that underneath the helmet and inside the pads are not cyborgs, but human beings who are no different fundamentally than the rest of us. Yes, they have incredible physical abilities that most of us could only dream to possess, but they are still brothers, fathers, sons, uncles, cousins, friends, acquaintances, people that you run into at the grocery store that you may only see once every three weeks. They're no different than everyone else. And we become conditioned as football fans, whether this was part of the plan or not, when they set up the NFL and it grew and became more popular, we're conditioned to align ourselves with our favorite teams. And we find a greater level of peace and security when we know that everything's fine with our favorite team. The coach is under contract. The players are under contract. No one is complaining. No one is unhappy. No one is trying to get traded. No one is trying to get more money. And when those those disputes emerge, our knee-jerk reaction as fans is to align with the team. And who is the team? The team is the owner. We get behind the billionaires and we cheer them on in these fights. And we, we never really see it, or at least we're not wired to initially see it from the perspective of the individual who has only a few opportunities over the course of his playing career to get properly compensated, to take a stand, to control his life. Maybe a guy never wanted to play in the city that drafted him, but he had no choice. He had to go there. And he's at a point where he wants to move on, like a Devontae Adams leaving the Packers for the Raiders. Always wanted to play for the Raiders. Now the Packers give him a chance to. In past years, I'm not sure the Packers would have said, we'll honor your wishes. They may have said, we hold your rights. You're stuck here. You play for us or you play for no one. So I want to see more fans Instead of just, and Billy Crystal and Jerry Seinfeld have similar bits that they've used over the years where they say that sports fans are just rooting for laundry. I'd like to think that fans at some point will realize that the human beings inside the laundry deserve greater consideration than they've gotten over the decades that we have been zealous fans of a given team. And either you're with us or you're against us. And we're only going to support you as long as you're happy. If you're not happy, we're going to take it as a personal affront and we're going to be against you and your effort to get whatever it is you're looking for. One of the things you've pushed back, uh, I'd say a fair bit uh, over the last couple of years, and it's brought up in the book as well, is the draft. You, you say that you don't enjoy the draft, that you have, you have some issues with the way that it operates. I wanted to sort of just put something to you and take, get your reaction to this, because we have a system over here in, in England where you have the Premier League soccer, where you do have free, mo free movement, you do not have a draft. Because the best young players over here basically want to play for three or four teams who can offer them the most money when they are 17 and 18 years old, they are often stashed behind world-class players. Their route to have a career is blocked and we see many many careers i'd say probably hundreds of careers have been wasted squandered and ruined as a consequence of bad decisions made when you're too young really to know any better and you choose the wealth which is understandable anybody would and you are stuck i wonder if there's an argument to be made at all that even though it might not be your ideal decision to play for the jaguars for example that the NFL and the draft provides you with an opportunity you wouldn't consider typically, but it is still an opportunity that perhaps people in other sports would avoid, but maybe it is beneficial. Well, if that opportunity is there, it's for the Jaguars to convince a guy like Trevor Lawrence to take advantage of it. It, it, it one of my problems with the draft is it rewards failure that the worse you are, the better position you have to involuntarily bring a player to your team that will presumably help you make it better. Although we've seen over time, the dysfunctional teams tend to stay dysfunctional. And also the current draft process and approach 
creates unintended consequences like the allegations against Dolphins owner Stephen Ross that he offered Brian Flores, the former coach of the team, $100,000 for each game he lost in 2019. So the Dolphins would eventually have the first overall pick in 2020. But for me, and I, I, I think there are answers to those questions. And there, there was a time back in the 70s and, and probably into the 80s before college football was as available on TV as it now is. There was a small handful of elite programs that would go six or seven deep with blue chip college prospects coming from high school. And they would say whatever they had to say to get the player to sign the letter of intent to accept the scholarship. And then he shows up and he can't get any playing time and he never gets a chance to develop. Well, with the proliferation of televised college football came players making informed decisions as to where I'm gonna go. If I go to this school, I'm gonna be stuck behind this guy, this guy, this guy, if I go to this school, I get to play right away. And I think that same mindset would apply for guys coming out of college. You know, if you're a great quarterback right now and you're available in the draft, let's say Malik Willis, who may be the first quarterback taken this year. Who knows? Who knows? We're still four weeks from the draft as we're having this discussion. Who knows what it's ultimately going to be? He would never choose to go play for the Chiefs. Why would he? They've got their quarterback. He would never choose to go play for the Bills. He wouldn't choose to go play for the Cowboys. They've got their quarterback. So I think that's where having a good agent becomes beneficial and I know that once I started to learn more about how the NFL works the argument of being a draft pick at all when you get to around six or seven it's better to not be drafted because if you're not drafted you get to work with your agent to identify the best opportunity to go in as an undrafted free agent where you're going to get the best education the best training the best experience and have the best opportunity to make the final 53-man roster and there have been teams in the past who have drafted a guy that they really didn't need but they feared that if he went undrafted he would go to this other team where he could make more of a splash I mean there is that kind of mercenary quality to it and Machiavellian approach where teams are always looking at what other teams are doing what we're doing what makes us better and they use those draft picks to squat on someone's rights and ideally there would be no draft there would be another system it's never going to happen the draft is too popular I understand that it's as quixotic as any of the takes that I ever have will be. But I like to have the conversation because if I talk to enough people about it, or if I talk to single individual people about it long enough, I eventually convince them to see it my way. Yeah, I think you at one point you compared having draft picks to essentially having a scratch card, you know, trying to win um, an amount of money. And never let it be said that I'm not up for a gimmick. I actually have a scratch card here and I'm going <laughs> to scratch it off. And if, and if it wins, Mike, then um, thank you essentially for sparking. I've not done a scratch card in about 15 years. So I'm just, let's have a look. 200, 100, 100. It's all going to come down to the last one. Always does. Five pounds. No, yeah. no, yeah. no winner. I'm afraid that's a, that's Sorry. a draft bust. Yeah. But, but that, that's what happens. And teams view the unscratched lottery ticket as having so much value. Now, some do. That's what's fascinating about the current mindset in the NFL. The Rams, with their success and their willingness to give up the best of the unscratched lottery tickets and trade them for established players, they've created a mindset where some teams are willing to do it. But to make it work, you need to have some teams that want to trade the picks for the established players. And then you need to have other teams that value those picks and are willing to part ways with the player. Tyree Kill, for example, going from the Chiefs to the Dolphins. The Chiefs were thrilled. People think, why would they be happy? They're losing one of the best players in the NFL. What? Well, because he's 28. He's not going to play for them forever. And they're moving that asset at a time where they can get five draft picks and avoid paying him $75 million over the next three years that they would rather devote to other areas of their roster. And they have a plan for moving forward. So you need a team that's willing to say, we'll gladly part with the picks for the player. And you need to have a team that says, we'll gladly part with the player for the picks. And we've got enough of a mix now of both kinds of teams that we're seeing more and more of these trades. The history that you talk about in the league, I found quite interesting. I mean, I think a lot of United Kingdom based NFL fans have taken to the sport recently. I mean, it's the, the sport has grown so much over here. Uh, for me, it was just going to a game when I lived in Vancouver for a year, 20 years ago. For other people, it's going to the Wembley games, perhaps watching it more on Sky because it's now readily available. But 
you know, when you, you, you speak about someone like Johnny Unitas, for example, I don't know a great deal about him because I've not grown up with this being the national sport in this country. How interested are you in the history of the league? Or is your interest more spurred by the lessons that can be learned from the past? Well, part of it is when you're 56 and you developed a strong interest in the NFL in really 1972 with the Immaculate Reception game, most of the history of the league you were alive for. Now, Johnny Unitas's best days predated my life and or awareness of the NFL. But I think the history of the league is fascinating. And when we consider how the rules have changed, how dramatically the game has changed, and YouTube has plenty of old games from the 70s, 80s, 90s, the level of brutality that was met with nonchalance by the broadcasters. It's stunning in comparison to the way the game is now, and you really can sense, it's palpable, how much the game has pivoted toward protecting the health and safety of players. That part of it is incredible to me. And the fact that Johnny Unitas was able to have such a great career as a passer, as, a, as an accumulator of high-level statistics, 47 straight games with a touchdown pass, that is a record that stood for decades. It's amazing through all the changes that were made to beef up the passing game, to make offense more exciting, to make the game more exciting. That record stood for as long as it did. And I'd, I'd love to know how Johnny Unitas would have thrived in today's NFL, where the rules protect the quarterback against getting thrown around, protect the receivers against getting mugged as they tried to get open before the ball was in the air. And the game is so much more wide open now. What he did was fascinating. And Part of me wishes I would have been around to watch him play, but part of me is glad that I wasn't because, you know, when you're, when you're getting closer and closer to the end, you, you're kind of glad to not be 10 years closer than you otherwise would be. One thing that perhaps the NFL has in common with uh, the Premier League over here is that owners increasingly seem to be making headlines for the wrong reasons. And reading about the misadventures of Jimmy Haslam was quite a topical segment of your book. Does it somewhat explain, you know, just by reading that, I was kind of thinking, yeah, this kind of says a lot about what's going on in Cleveland at the moment. It feels slightly circus-esque. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Hey, Jimmy Haslam, I joked about this, has something in common with his new quarterback. They both had to sweat out an indictment. And Haslam had to do it for a lot longer. And I thought for a while he was going to be indicted on federal charges. It felt like they were working their way up the ladder of his truck stop company, Pilot Flying J, which had a scam in place to defraud customers. And either he's Mr. Magoo. I don't know how aware your audience is of Mr. Magoo. but We, we are very aware of Mr. Magoo. Either he's completely clueless as to what's going on around him in the company they ran, or he was involved in it. Either way, it was a horrible look. But... The reason that I delved into the off-field escapades of some of these owners, at the end of the day, they don't get punished the way players do. And it's no surprise. The commissioner isn't hired and paid by the players. The commissioner is hired and paid by the owners. There was a time during the lockout in 2011 where the league was pushing the idea that the commissioner is the commissioner for all constituencies of football from the upper level to the lowest level, to the players, to the owners, to the coaches, to the fans, to the media, and it's baloney. His constituency is the 32 owners because that's who decides whether or not he gets the job, whether he keeps the job and how much money he gets paid to do the job. So the owners do get treated differently. There is a double standard and I wanted that to come through and I didn't want to harp on it and I didn't want it to be a textbook. I wanted to show through the anecdotes and the examples how. So when the reader looks at it, reads about what happened to the players who get in trouble and then reads about what happened to the owners who get in trouble, you're going to come to the conclusion, I think, something's not right here. Something doesn't add up. There's a different standard that applies to the employees than applies to the bosses. You talk about something a lot on Twitter, Mike, that I, I, I'm so very interested in. I wanted to ask you about it. Um, fan journalists, uh, journalists who act like fans, um, do you think this is a new phenomena or has it always existed to some degree? It's probably always existed to some degree. And I think it's more prevalent now that the fans can talk back to the journalists in ways like never before, like social media. Social media is the equivalent of having a million people in a large field and they pass around a megaphone and you hear what each individual person has to say. And I think with so much competition in sports media now, so many different places where people can get their information, 
you have to pander at some level to that fan base. You have to become a fan. You have to think like a fan of the team in order to get fans of the team to read what you have to say, or you troll them, which is another way to get them to read your stuff and pay attention to what you have to say. So I do think that for plenty of writers, broadcasters, radio hosts, especially, you see the line get crossed from objectivity to subjectivity to blatant fandom of the team because it requires you to do it if you're going to be competitive with the other sources of information that are out there. What do you think is the state of NFL journalism currently? Well, the problem fundamentally flows from the fact that the NFL owns and operates its own media company because what occurs is they have a small army of people who are paid by the NFL. They are paid to cover the entity that pays them. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. I have no journalism training or education. I have 20 years experience now, and I've learned enough to know that there's a problem with getting a paycheck from the entity that you cover. And what happens is when I point that out, the people who are paid to cover the NFL by the NFL get resentful. They don't like it. They don't like it to be pointed out. They'd rather we not talk about it. And then other people in the industry who don't work for NFL Network or NFL.com or for the NFL directly or for one of the teams, because the teams have their own media operations now as well. They get mad at me because their attitude is, hey, it's more jobs for everybody. We don't have to worry about people coming to look to take our jobs because they have a job with NFL Network or they have a job with clevelandbrowns.com or whatever the case may be. But what happens is this. The league gets accustomed to the type of coverage it gets from the people who are directly employed by the league and they begin to expect that from others. They expect it from, for example, people who work for one of the broadcast partners because it's just a stone's throw from working directly for the league, even though I don't work for the league. It makes it uncomfortable at times because they're used to having people look the other way on certain things. They like people to look the other way. And that's why it makes independent voices so critical. Independent voices who are willing to to say, there's a problem here that we need to take seriously and we're not going to ignore it. We're not going to brush it under the rug. We're not going to downplay it. We're not going to just treat it like the elephant in the room. We're going to delve into it aggressively. That's where it is, and it's up to the, the audience member to understand what you're getting based upon where you're getting it from. And that's my goal. I'm not telling people don't go to nfl.com, don't watch NFL Network. I'm saying understand what you're getting when you do, that you aren't going to get the full picture. It's kind of like in politics here in the United States. When you turn on a given cable channel, just know what you're getting. Just understand that you're getting a certain agenda and viewpoint here, and you're getting a different one here. And you factor that into how you consume the content. You kind of have to do that with the NFL as well. So what is life like for somebody who basically says what he thinks? Well, uh, it's interesting at times. It's challenging at others. But at the end of the day, here's how I look at it. I practiced law for 18 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. There was about a 10 year overlap where I was doing both. I practiced in a very uh, exclusive litigation mode where I didn't do contracts. I didn't do real estate. I just was fighting all the time. I was a barrister as as, uh, folks in your audience would say. So when you fight all the time, what happens is half the people you deal with hate you. Half the people you deal with like you. And my goal was overriding everything else, make sure that I do enough that the people who are supposed to like me don't hate me, my clients. You fight for them against others. So I I used to say early on in this, when I was kind of a renegade and pissing everyone off from time to time, or all the time as the case may be, any day that, that, that fewer than half the people hate me is a good day in comparison to what I'm used to because I'm used to walking into the room and having daggers stared at me by the opposing lawyer or the, the opposing party or the witness who was there that day. So, so I, I, my background is I'm used to having some blatant and or muted hostility in everything I do. So that's kind of there. If you're going to tell it like it is, that's going to be part of your existence. You're going to get called out from time to time by a guy like Bruce Arians, who for his final act, as an NFL head coach at his final press conference comes back to the podium 
to say, I enjoyed working with all the reporters out there, even the folks across the country in Florio, right where you want, it's okay. I mean, look, I, 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 it goes to the territory and I love it because, you know, people are like, oh, you must've been mortified. No, it shows that they, they read it and they heed it. And as the kids say, you're occupying space in their brains rent free. So, uh, but it is challenging when you're not going to toe the party line, when you don't shake pom poms on behalf of everything else that's out there, when you're willing to call BS from BA or anyone else, it creates some awkward moments. It creates some interesting days, but it's also been a rewarding life for me. And I don't work for a living. This is not work for me. So as long as I get to keep doing it, if that's the worst I have to deal with, every day is a damn good day. I wanted to um, end by asking you a couple of questions about the team that I write about most, which is the Seahawks. And I wondered how you would describe them currently. Are they irrelevant now? Are they intriguing? Is there a better word to describe them, perhaps? They are, to me right now, intriguing is, is kind of the word. I'm searching for the right word. They are perplexing. How about that? I don't know what the plan is. You have a 70-year-old coach. You're kind of in a full rebuild with the trade of Russell Wilson. DK Metcalf could be next. When Pete Carroll says we intend to keep DK Metcalf, intend is the key word because he said we have no intention to trade Russell Wilson. Be careful of the word intend or intention if you're a Seahawks fan, because that could be the clue that something's coming. Why wouldn't you trade DK Metcalf now? He's going to want $28 million a year, and you don't have a quarterback to get him the football, at least not for now. I want to know what their plan is. Are they hoping to spin the clock back to 2010, where they emerge from the draft with a Russell Okung and an Earl Thomas, and you lay the foundation for a great team, and you hit on some late-round picks like Cam Chancellor and Richard Sherman, and the next thing you know, you've got Legion of Boom 2.0, and you find a quarterback somewhere, somehow. Good luck finding a quarterback in round three like you did in 2012. But I, I feel like they're in a full-blown rebuild, a conscious take a step back. You know, the, the mindset we talked about earlier, the teams that are willing to go out and trade away draft picks to load up now and win now versus the teams that are willing to trade talented players in the name of building for the future. The, the Seahawks have been on both sides of that. They gave up the two first-round picks to get Jamal Adams. And now they're taking draft picks to offload Russell Wilson. It's just a weird time for the team. And I wouldn't know what to think if I was a Seahawks fan right now. So perplexing would be the word. I want to know what this plan is. And what is the bar for this year? What does it take to get Pete Carroll another year? What is the expectation? Every coach is judged by the expectations going into the season. What are the fair expectations for the Seahawks this year? They go 4-13. and 13. Is anyone going to say, well, that was a failure? We kind of expect that they're going to backslide until we know who their quarterback is going to be. Surely it's not going to be Drew Locke or Geno Smith. Is it going to be Baker Mayfield? Are they going to draft somebody? There's still chapters left in this book, and we'll see what they do with these draft picks. But I would be very confused, concerned, and bewildered by where the Seahawks are right now. What do you think's wrong with the word rebuild? Because Pete Carroll is going to great lengths. Uh, to insist that this isn't a rebuild. But I guess, the, you know, if it looks like a dog, if it, it barks like a dog, it, it's probably a dog. And to anybody looking at this seriously, the Seahawks are rebuilding, aren't they? It almost sounds a little bit like the guy who's in the bar for the 10th night in a row saying he doesn't have a drink problem. It is a rebuild, isn't it, Mike? But why is it such a, um, an ugly word to use for this kind of situation? Because I think in today's NFL, part of the obligation is to sell the fan base each and every year on the idea that you're trying to win the Super Bowl. You'll hear that from time to time in various forms and fashions from coaches, general managers, owners, players. We want to win the Super Bowl. Well, if that's how you measure success, you're going to fail far more often than you succeed. I mean, the Patriots, 33% success rate in the greatest run we've ever seen of excellence in the NFL. They still failed twice as often as they hit if the goal is to win the Super Bowl. The goal is to be relevant past Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving. I think that's the goal. You want to be playing in games that have meaning in December and into January now that there's a 17-game season. But rebuild implies that you're taking a step back, that it's going to take some time, that maybe this year isn't a good year to be invested. And I think every team wants its fans to think that every year is a good year 
to be invested. That's why the NFL has to be thrilled with what's happened with the Bengals. They are proof positive that low expectations can be exceeded. So I think it's useful to Pete Carroll to have low expectations because if they fail, then he can say, what do you expect? But you still want to aspire to something more than whatever the expectations are. So I think that's why rebuild gets used sparingly because you don't want your fan base to say, well, why should I go to the games this year? Why should I watch the games this year? Because the NFL is now so focused on one year at a time that you need people to think in every year you're going to be competitive. What kind of messages do you get from the British broadcasters when you say pissed off on air? I don't know. It was, I, I, well, I, I, we joke about this all the time. I don't know who or why the person who is responsible for bleeping our words. Uh, I don't know what they're looking for because they will often bleep words that they shouldn't. And they'll often miss words that they should have bleeped. And my, one of my theories is that maybe some nights of the week when our show's on, because it's, it's on on a delayed basis and it's either on at seven o'clock your time or five o'clock or what it moves around. And of course, our UK fans complain to me about it as if I can do anything about it. But I have a theory that sometimes there must be a soccer match on that the person with the finger on the buttons paying attention to and missing things. Cause we've had certain words get through that should not have gotten through, including one that begins with a W should not have gotten through, but did. Interesting. Uh, and to come back to what you say, uh, just to finish at the start of the book, hopefully the league will, move towards finding a way over the next 20 years to do things better. How confident are you that it will? Well, why does it need to? <laughs> That's what I think the attitude is. We're printing money. Everything that we do, it doesn't matter if it's misguided. It doesn't matter if it creates a PR problem. I once had Jeff Fisher, the former Rams and Titan slash Oilers coach who was on the competition committee when one of the arguments was coming up about enhanced replay review for officiating. He joked, and I'm not sure he was completely joking, that, you know, these bad calls give you something to talk about. And it does keep the NFL in the news. But does the NFL really want the news the day after a big game to be dominated by what went wrong? Shouldn't it be about what went right? So I think in the United States, one of the key aspects that the league needs to be concerned about is legalized gambling, because as more and more of our states accept and adopt legalized gambling systems that's more money that is legally wagered that's going to be riding on the outcome of games and that's where the nfl has i think its biggest challenges improved officiating full-time officials the sky judge concept used across the board to bridge the gap between what the individuals on the field who are just trying to not get trampled see or don't see and what the rest of us see while we're watching at home in high definition on 70 inch monitors the protection of inside information Who's really injured? Who's not injured? Who's in the game plan? Who's not in the game plan? Who's going to be featured? Who's not going to be featured? Is it run heavy? Is it pass heavy? These are all bits of inside information that can get misappropriated. There was a complaint made recently by one of the major sports books in Las Vegas that someone made major bets on the Buccaneers to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl three days before Tom Brady unretired. And they complained that someone had inside information and the NFL should investigate. Those are going to be more common because there is inside information and how the NFL protects it or doesn't needs to be taken seriously because I think the worst case scenario for the NFL is there's some major scandal and Congress decides to pass a law that creates an agency, a federal agency that would regulate professional sports, specifically the NFL, and then the NFL would no longer be exclusively responsible to run its own business. There would be some outside body. It would have to worry about placating or they may investigate, they may find something, someone may get in trouble. I don't think the NFL wants that. So the challenge for the NFL is to get its backyard in order because if it doesn't, the government's gonna come around and do it. And the NFL may not like how they cut the grass and where they plant the flowers and what they, what they rip out by way of weeds and throw over the fence. Mike, congratulations on the book. It is available in the States. Um, Playmakers is the name. Have you got the date again of when it's available in the UK? They tell me May 4, it was April 7, but for the folks who have ordered on the UK Amazon platform, they are now being told it will be released on May 4. That's what I'm told. But you can still order it now. And you, you should. Can, 
and you can order it now and you can read it now if you do what I do and buy it on the Kindle app. You just can't have the hard copy. We'll have to watch it on a, or read it on a, on a, on a tablet or something like that. Mike, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And the very best of luck with the book. Great talking to you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for buying the book and uh, thanks for all the kind words about it.